Armoire makes getting dressed easy. With a clothing rental membership from Armoire, build the perfect wardrobe with brands that are high quality, unique, and recommended just for you. All you have to do is take a five minute style quiz and select items from your dynamic, personalized closet. The styles show up at your door in as little as two days. Then, when you're ready for new clothes, just swap them out for more new to you styles. Like many of you, my personal style has evolved over the years. But if I want to try something new, sometimes it's hard to know what pieces will work for me. Rather than going to the mall for hours and spending too much money on pieces I might not like, Armoire allows me to rent high quality designer clothing for any occasion. I can try styles I never considered before without worrying about the store's return policy. Of course, all of this sounds great, but what's even better is that it's a woman-founded business. You benefit from finding the perfect outfits all while supporting a business that was built by women just like us. Right now, our listeners can give Armour a try and get up to 50% off of their first month. That's up to $125 off. Just visit armoire.style slash murder in the rain. That's A-R-M-O-I-R-E dot style slash murder in the rain, one word, to get up to 50% off your first month and never worry about what to wear again. Try Armour today. This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Last week, I told you about Robert Silvera, a.k.a. Sidetrack, a.k.a. the Boxcar Killer, and his years-long series of murders. Sidetrack traveled at will, with no record of his movements, and his pool of victims were the unhoused, the drifters, and the fellow railhoppers he encountered. People on the fringe, the kind who wouldn't be missed. This week, the end of the murders, the arrest, and many confessions of Robert Silvera, as well as the California police detective who moonlighted his Elvis, a quirk which endeared him to the killer, and also led to this cop writing the actual book on the case. This is Freedom Part 2. Retired Spokane police detective Bob Granadetti had compiled perhaps the largest database of information about the FTRA, the Freight Train Riders of America, and linked them to food stamp fraud, trafficking, hundreds of thefts and assaults, and murders. Granadetti discovered the FTRA's existence after recording 10 unsolved deaths between 1990 and 1992 on the High Line between Seattle and Minneapolis. Bodies found near the tracks along the route from Cheney, Washington to Sandpoint, Idaho. This was the same period Grandinetti noticed a significant presence of FTRA members rolling through Spokane. The element that stood out in these reports was the state in which the bodies were discovered, with their shirts or coats pulled up over their heads and their pants pulled down, later learned to be a trademark of FTRA killings, though not a trademark of Silvera's murders. So multiple people were doing that and leaving them that way? Yeah, there were a ton found that way. There was a guy named Juan Lara, I believe, who was killed by several men. And he was one of the ones that was found, I think, in Texas. People who were thrown off trains, people who were put on the tracks and run over by trains. It seems like, I mean, it's definitely a gang, but it seems hard to have a gang that sprawls that wide, you know? Oh, it's so loosely associated that, and yeah, and it was so early in having internet, having that sort of connectivity that it was impossible to track. Most law enforcement agencies had no idea that these people were like rolling through their towns every day. Can you just imagine though, like spreading, okay, we're going to, when we kill people, this is what we're going to do, but without internet and phone, like, wow. Oh, well, we were laughing at, we have this inside joke of honking on a bobo, which is from (laughs) an old Aerosmith video or interview. An album, I think, is called Honkin' on Bobo. Yeah, and that's what it's called for Steven Tyler when he's doing his harmonica. And then we oh. adopted that for other things and we'll, like, if having a joint, or, like, you honking on that Bobo. And then we 
I sent him a meme because it was someone Snapchatting and they're like honking on this bobo at this lake and I feel like the silliest goose. And I'm like, isn't that funny that it spreads like yeah, that? Yeah, like no connection and someone hears it and correlates well, it, it to the same thing. Well, it is kind of a thing. silly saying and I feel like you could easily Yeah. I was like, well that's how the, the same thing. That's how the Marilyn Manson rib rumor yes. oh, I was got just, spread across the I was country just in middle that. school. I saw a, a TikTok <laughs> video about like how is it that we had we're pre-internet and that yes. spread. <laughs> and everyone of that age knows or that. Or like the Tootsie Pop star. Yes. Where you get the free mm-hmm. one. Because I, sw- I kid you not, Dairy Queen gave me a free one one time when right. I brought them my wrapper. And it must have just been the worker. Yeah. I like, thought it was cute. Yeah. And had but... a Tootsie Pop in his pocket? No, no. Like I brought one up from the aisle and I'm like, here, I have my wrapper. Like I just boldly <laughs> acted as if any of it's like, all right. <laughs> One Congrats. free lollipop, please. <laughs> yeah. It probably cost him like 13 cents of right. his paycheck. But I was like, oh, cool. It works. So funny. Anyway, for those that don't know, the rapper of the Tootsie Pop, some of them had a Native American shooting an arrow at a star. And there was this shared belief among, amongst our childhood that if you sent those in, you would get a free Tootsie Pop. In October of 1995, Paul Wayne Matthews, who had the nickname Glassy because of his artificial eye, was the next person to suffer under Sidetrack's self-applied authority. Paul Matthews' last known address was in Austin. He was originally from Arkansas, and he'd lost contact with his family a decade earlier when he left home after his wife died. He spent his days riding freight trains and drinking alcohol. Matthews and Silvera encountered each other under a bridge in Spokane, a well-known spot where rail riders waited to catch their next train. They'd first met six months earlier at a mission in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Matthews told Silvera he had to go to Haver, Montana to collect his food stamps, and then he was just going to wander the rails along the High Line for a while. Silvera said he also had to go there to reestablish food stamp benefits. So what's with going to that area? Is that like where their home address was, or is it easier to get them there, the food stamps? Silvera had just been in Montana, Haver, Montana, a few months ago, or uh, Whitefish, Uh where he killed Charles Boyd. Right. And he was using his ID to establish food stamps. Oh, so he was going back to do I that. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I know it's not victimless and taking the murders away from it. Anyone that wants to put up with the effort it takes to file government benefits and who wants to fill out the paperwork and talk with those people and wait in the lines, go for it. <laughs> you know? like <laughs> Even if you're ripping them off. like... My crime is going to the DMV what to get your, more tags. What if your thing was like the thing you loved the most was waiting in long lines? <laughs> like, <laughs> then it's a perfect crime. I know, right? Someone like Silvera, a writer or a transient of some sort, would probably be pretty patient because they often would just have to wait hours and hours for rides. That's true. Through weather, while they're hungry, all that stuff. Also, it was found later that Silvera had 28 food stamp accounts. Whoa. In different names all across the country. So he and, wasn't hungry. And for yeah, from each one he was collecting one hundred nineteen dollars per. Wow. Uh, and then he was using that to, you know, I mean, feed his life, but also feed his drug use. He was a heroin addict, and um, I think a crack addict, and probably meth. Yikes. So that'll do it. That'll That's do impressive, it. though. But it's quite a quite a scam. That is widespread. Wow. And it was and it was not just him. It was a lot of people, a lot of writers and other dudes he knew uh, that did that as well. That was their job. They caught out from Spokane on the northern Burlington line, heading east, and hopped off the train 15 miles north of Kalispell in Whitefish, Montana, one of the towns in which the FTRA may have first formed. Paul Matthews and Robert Silvera set up camp under a train trestle that ran over a bend in the Whitefish River. The pair then went to a nearby market to buy food and jugs of Thunderbird wine. And on their walk back, Silvera felt his first urge to kill his companion. Back at the camp, Silvera and Matthews started a fire with pieces of wood from the end of a rotted telephone pole and began to drink their wine. As the alcohol coursed through them, they taunted each other into several shoving matches and a lengthy fist fight until calling it a draw and going to their respective sleeping bags. It's just, I can picture it, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it's like, who does that? Yeah. It feels at times like it was sort of a pack mentality mm-hmm. and there was... There always had to be an alpha, I yeah, think. Yeah, that seems Probably. right. Which makes sense for those kind of circumstances. Incredibly dangerous at all times. Yes. Well, also, yes. you have to think they're probably individually very dangerous because you have to be when you right. live that kind of life. Mm-hmm. It's such like a 
a loner. Yet you go, you form these packs, but you're still very much on your own. You're the only one that really has your own right. Back. Laying awake, fuming at Matthews, Silvera heard a train approaching from far off. He rose, hefted the four-foot-long section of telephone pole they'd used for fuel nearby, and walked it over to where Paul Matthews slept deeply. Silvera raised the wood hunk over his head and slammed it onto the man's head many times, oh. finally relenting when he saw brain and chips of skull among all the blood. That's how he's done all of them, isn't it? Every single one it's has like, been, yeah. They're so in a early. tent or something, and then he crushes their head. And it may start in some other way with a fight or a, a stabbing, but it always ends well, he's with He's building that. himself up to it. Oof. Ew. That is so gnarly. He chucked both wine bottles into the river, followed by Matthew's backpack, which he knew would soon take on air and sink. Silvera quickly dragged the body into a small ravine and covered it with Matthew's sleeping bag, then ran to the train and hopped on, ending up in Spokane, Washington. There, Silvera had a passport photo taken for a fake Idaho ID card in the name of Paul Wayne Matthews so he could establish new welfare benefits in multiple cities. And that's what I was talking about him going back mm. to Haver initially. On train trestles, under bridges, scrawled across concrete pillars, and inside the boxcars he rode, you could find Silvera's tag all across the states. It comprised of the sidetrack moniker in big, bold letters, and below that a set of railroad tracks, a connected spider web, and a cracked skull. It was a warning that hissed, I am death, and you could be next. When police later searched a Haver, Montana hobo camp, their terminology, they came across a hand-drawn FTRA sign featuring Silvera's sidetrack tag, among several others, and a message across the bottom. Whoever thrashed this camp is dead meat. Unless you fix it, then we'll just make you wish you were dead. By November of 1995, Silvera moved about freely on the trains between San Francisco, El Paso, Memphis, Haver, Montana, and Little Rock, Arkansas, using the alias Roy Allen Bell. This was found on an arrest record from Vancouver, Washington, where the most recent victim, Paul Matthews, was arrested for trespassing on railroad property with Roy Allen Bell. William Pettit Jr. was a big man, six foot four, with a thick mustache, a receding hairline, and beads woven into his ponytail. Mm -hmm. He was a longtime transient who rolled with a ton of gear aside from his pack and sleeping bag, like a Coleman camping stove and a portable radio which he hauled around on his flat-tired bicycle. Originally from Maryland, he had lost touch with his family years prior. William felt no fear when Silvera hopped into the station boxcar he was occupying in an Oregon train yard. The men were familiar with each other from staying in various missions and centers for the houseless across the states. Mistakenly expecting the train to take them to Portland, it was instead sidetracked for maintenance, landing them in Salem. It was pouring rain as it had been for a week, so they decided to hunker down for the night and hop an early train the next day. They drank beer, and after having to split the last one, an argument ensued as they always did with Silvera. He was intimidated by William Pettit's size. This is someone who could beat Silvera in a fair fight. According to Silvera, Pettit challenged him by waving his sleeping bag at him like a bullfighter with his cape. <laughs> Silvera said from his position lying down, he cocked his leg back, and kicked Pettit so hard in the face it killed him instantly. <gasps> Yet Silvera's rage had not subsided, so he rose and continued to kick William Pettit in the ribs and head. He then picked up a two-by-four and continued the beating, quote, flattening Pettit's head beyond recognition. Silvera next waded into a nearby creek where he undressed and let his bloodied clothes float away in the current. After washing off, he dressed in a sweatshirt and jeans, returned to the boxcar, and donned Pettit's military-style jacket. He stole some of the dead man's other belongings, like his new steel toe boots, the radio, and the Coleman stove, all balanced atop the bike with flat tires. Silvera's final touch in the boxcar was writing the word tattooed on his neck onto the wall above the body in blue marker. Freedom. William Pettit's body was discovered two days later, on December 3rd, 1995, in Millersburg, Oregon, around 20 miles south of Salem. My guess is moving that boxcar for maintenance was a low priority, hence the two-day gap in finding the crime scene. From the single crime scene photo I've seen of the Pettit murder, it looks like he was jack-rolled while he was sleeping. William Pettit is on his back, wrapped in his unzipped bag, with its hood pulled over the top half of his bludgeoned head. You can see his awesome mustache and lower jaw jutting out from the hood. 
Below that are some of the beads he wore in his hair. His left hand is curled on his chest, and his right is lax, resting at his waist. To me, this was an ambush killing. William Pettit was identified after autopsy by his fingerprints, which were on record from an arrest. So do you think he was lying about how he was killed? I think so. Yeah, he often did. unlikely. That was a theme. I got a lot of this material from the book written on the case by the one of the detectives, mm-hmm. Murder on the Rails. And from what I understand, Silvera had some input on the book. And so everything is a little skewed. I see. Yeah. He, he kind of puts in, oh, this guy was a pedophile. This guy tried to make a sexual mm-hmm. move oh, on course, me. This guy, whatever. Explain his actions. Yep, every time. Because the murder occurred within Salem, the investigation was assigned to police detective Mike Quakenbush. Detective Quakenbush sent a teletype to law enforcement agencies around the country to establish Pettit's travel history and to see if there were similar homicides in their areas. Two of the many responses he received were from Salt Lake City Detective Guy Yoshikawa and Kansas Bureau of Investigation Special Agent Bruce Meller. Yoshikawa was the lead on the April 21, 1995 murder of James Hooter McLean, who was stabbed in the ribs and beaten to death with a two-by-four during a drunken argument with Robert Silvera. Agent Bruce Miller worked out of KBI headquarters in Topeka and investigated the murder of Charles Boyd, who'd been killed with a concrete block in a Kansas State Park in late July 1995. Detective Yoshikawa had been the one to give Agent Miller the name and birth date of Robert Silvera, which he'd retrieved from the SLC County Jail System. That gets a good police work bell. Yeah. Imagine how hard it was to do that kind of research before our computers we have now. Yeah, It was all by hand. Yoshikawa had to submit that to a actual person to enter it into a computer. I imagine it was a lot more schmoozing over the phone, too, to like get what you want from people, to get them to actually go to a file room and fax you over. For an interstate murder case? Yeah. Yeah, Really? Well, just that they were even willing to do that much work for people that you would think they could easily dismiss. Yeah. Ah, uh, we we don't know who this is. We don't know where they were. I think it we'll was get just to it. a whole other skill set people had back then. Like we mm-hmm. we have people who are very good detectives now, but they maybe aren't good socially. Right? You know? <laughs> yeah. The Silvera name went nowhere until three months later, when Agent Meller returned to the case after finishing up other work. Among a list of aliases inside the case file was the name Robert Silvera. Michael Kleitz of Waldport, Oregon had been a rail rider for six months. He had a tall blonde mohawk braided with strands of beads, like victim Michael Pettit, and also had an Aryan Brotherhood-style double lightning bolt tattoo on the side of his head. He looked hard, but his youthful face and slim frame belied that. He was only 24. He was new to the lifestyle, but Michael Kleitz was no stranger to the peril of the rails. Three months earlier, in Longview, Washington, he had escaped death, surviving two stab wounds inflicted by an acquaintance who thought Michael was, quote, messing around with his girlfriend. It was in Eugene that Michael Kleitz and Robert Silvera first met on December 6, 1995, five days after he'd killed William Pettit. Silvera knew the three men the newish writer was talking to in the train yard, so he stopped to chat. Silvera told them he was returning to Haver, Montana, likely to collect food stamp benefits under his victim Paul Wayne Matthews' name. Kleitz asked if he could ride there with Silvera, but Silvera balked, saying he would only take him to Vancouver, Washington. They went off together to score drugs before the train they'd take to Montana arrived. Kleitz and Silvera then hopped onto the boxcar, and it had no more than started rolling through the yard when, of course, the two began to shout at each other, allegedly about Silvera ripping off the drug dealer they'd just bought from. Robert Silvera became enraged and caved in Kleitz's face with a metal pole. He tossed the metal into a body of water the train was passing by, then grabbed a hunk of wood and continued to pummel the man's face and head. After, he covered Kleit's ruined head and stole the boots from his feet. Before getting off the train outside of Portland, Silvera stopped to write freedom on the wall. Salem detective Quakenbush spoke to one of the men in the Eugene train yard that day talking to Michael Kleitz. That person, Bam Bam, knew Kleitz from the mission in Vancouver, Washington. At the mission in Vancouver, Quakenbush found a man who'd ridden a boxcar with Kleitz to Eugene, who said that the last time he'd seen Michael Kleitz, he was walking off in search of methamphetamine with a tall stranger who called himself Sidetrack. That's helpful. Mm-hmm. 
that he, he was able to capture that much info. It's all coming together. Here at Murder in the Rain, we love a good family mystery and we love a good video game. And now that we have the convenience of holding computers in our hands, we know the absolute joy of finding the perfect video game. Just like most of us, I like to wind down at night with some gameplay on my phone, usually while waiting for ads to finish on my streamer service. And June's journey is a perfect match. Step into the 1920s in the role of June Parker, who is searching for hidden clues to uncover the mystery of her sister's murder. You can use your keen observation skills to quickly uncover key pieces of information that lead to each chapter of the game. And of course, there's a scandalous hidden family secret to uncover. It has it all. Mystery, danger, romance. Where will each new chapter take you? Now, this isn't any old mystery game. You get to customize your very own estate island by decorating and building gardens and buildings. You can even chat and play with or against other players by joining a detective club. I'm pretty early into the game, but there is already so much to enjoy. The setting of the 1920s is fun and really beautifully done. The mystery is exciting, like when a character fell through a secret trap door. I like playing a game to relax, but to also stimulate my mind. It's not a difficult game, but you have to be paying attention and moving fast to find objects in time to multiply your score. June's Journey also features puzzling elements, like a torn up photograph that I had to reassemble. It's cool. Can you crack the case? Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. It was Christmas Eve Eve of 1995 in a dumping ground slash makeshift campsite in Barstow, California, when Robert Silvera and two other writers beat 44-year-old Michael Allen Brandolino to death over the course of three hours. Oof. He was an easy target for them, as he was a smaller person, as well as being epileptic. The cruelty he endured is unimaginable. Michael was outnumbered and had no way to defend himself. When his attackers finally took a break from savaging him, Brandolino tried to crawl away while they drank, and laughed around the fire. He was dragged back to the camp and kicked to death. The body was found six days later near a dry riverbed that ran beside Interstate 15, less than 900 feet north of a double set of railroad tracks. And two men, neither of which were Silvera, were convicted of the murder. Of course. That is brutal. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that, was, that was a lengthier part. I just I truncated a lot of the detail of that because it was, it was really awful. I could imagine. Awful. Yeah. Detective Quakenbush came across Choo Choo Johnson and a friend, both of them hobos, who were later to confirm key details about Silvera's appearance. And these are details from a documentary I watched called Mugshots, Robert Silvera, Third Railman, which is available on YouTube. Choo Choo Johnson and Bob Guitar Whitey Johnson, not related, met Silvera on a train out of Dunsmuir, California, heading north. The three hopped off in Portland, Oregon's Brooklyn train yard, Silvera, calling himself Paul Dykeman, offered to make them coffee to share. Whitey described Silvera as charming, engaging, patient, and courteous. Choo Choo took a photo of Silvera and guitar Whitey standing together in the train yard. Silvera's gear was also captured in the picture. You can see a sledgehammer handle with a taped grip sheathed in his pack. The caption on the back of the photo, in part, reads, He is a benign member of dreaded FTRA. Whitey said it would have been the perfect time for him and Choo Choo to be killed. Four in the morning with nowhere to go for help, Whitey said, if he wanted to do it then, he could have. Guitar Whitey quit riding the rails after he learned of Silvera's identity and how close he'd been to death by bludgeon. Oof. Yeah, that'd be scary. It was the night before Silvera's 37th birthday, March 2nd, 1996. Silvera was walking in the train yard at Roseville, California, northeast of Sacramento. There he was approached by a railroad agent, Billy Metcalf, who was only three years from retirement. By this time, Silvera knew he was wanted by law enforcement. The officer knew he had his man when Silvera gave him the alias Paul Dykeman, which was linked to Silvera by the list of aliases sent in the teletype from Detective Quakenbush. Embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Think of another name, man. <laughs> And that was something I tried to find, too. I don't know where he got that ID, but it had his picture on it and everything. Metcalf said he believed there was a warrant out in that name and asked if Silvera would ride in the truck to his office. 
Silvera politely agreed to do so. Before getting in the vehicle, he tossed his pack in the bed, took out his 9mm handgun, kicked it under the truck to Metcalf, and said, I will this to you. Metcalf said, okay, and he (sighs) grabbed the gun, (laughs) and he drove them to the office and had Silvera take a seat, uncuffed, while the officer made some phone calls. That's an interesting turn of events I didn't expect. Yeah, I thought it was going to be just a shootout, right? Yeah. The first call was to the Roseville Police Department, where Metcalf found there was a warrant out for Paul Dykeman slash Silvera's arrest. He could be held on a probation violation while the many cases against him came together. Metcalf hung up and asked if his name was Robert Joseph Silvera. Sidetrack nodded his head and said yes. Officer Metcalf had Silvera empty his pockets, then handcuffed him. He was shortly booked at the Placer County Sheriff's Department in nearby Auburn. Quote, his backpack, which contained some evidence of the killings in Oregon, was left behind in the evidence locker at the rail yard. Hmm. And I believe it was William Pettit's ID card, the beads from his hair, uh, some of his belongings, and also I think, I think some of Michael Clyde's belongings. How long did it take them to get those? I don't know when they got them, but I, I imagine it was pretty quick because he was moved to that jail and then detectives started coming in from different states. Yeah. And so they probably cleared that up pretty quick. But He's I thought that was funny. Helpful. That they, yeah. Josh, in what you were reading, did you feel like he what it wasn't kind of that arrogance of I'm not going to get caught and I'm above these guys, so I'll play along or lack of intelligence that he didn't think that anything would come from that? I don't think it was either of those. I think he was really worn out from life on the rails. And I think he had become tired of what he was compelled to do all the time. I think he didn't want to kill anymore. When you're in jail, you're going to have your three meals and yeah. Yeah, some structure, a a home, a a permanent roof. Yeah. Yeah. Not wondering if someone's going to kill you every time you sleep. I mean, wondering about it less, I suppose. Well, when you're that scary, you probably doesn't have to worry like someone else is going in. I think he was a pretty intimidating figure. There was an interview with him in prison talking about weightlifting. And he said the maximum, I think, oh, what was it? The maximum was 680. And he could bench press 545. I was going to say, he could lift a lot because those railroad oh, yeah, the, b- pieces mm-hmm. of wood that he would smash them with, those are incredibly heavy. I only know this because we went camping and needed firewood and that's the only wood we can find. And it took like <laughs> two incredibly large guys to bring yeah. one over. Wow. And he could hoist it no problem. That was another part of the book that that I, I read was um, someone, I think someone else in jail described him as scary strong. Just mm-hmm. that he didn't really look it because he was tall and kind of lean, but... But he was he was very strong. You just have to show that off once yeah. in the prison mm-hmm. yard and they're going to leave you alone. I mean, and I'm guessing his reputation preceded him. Yeah, exactly. Like, who's this guy? Oh, OK. We'll leave him alone. Now, did he have involvement in some of these Aryan gangs that you mentioned earlier? I think it was another loose association just to kind of say we believe in these things also. Mm. Uh, it may have been from people being in prison and and becoming associated with them. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to tell if it was like real. What was your? Is that, did that answer your question? Yeah, because yeah. I'm just wondering. You know, it's pretty well known that there are gangs of those types in prison, so they would they would probably know who he was. Oh, I think so. Yeah, by the, yeah, by the time he got there, I'm sure he was. They were well acquainted. Um, yeah, and just from having the FTRA association too, I'm yeah. sure there was a lot of a lot of chatter about that. Okay, and these are a few quotes from the Guardian. Finally, Detective Quakenbush's persistence paid off. On the afternoon of Saturday, March 2nd, 1996, he got a call at home from a railroad agent working in Roseville, one of the largest rail yards in the West. Hey, the bull said, I have Silvera. Wow. At the jail, Quakenbush leaned close to a plexiglass window separating him from Silvera and asked, when you ride the trains, what name do you use? Silvera answered blankly, sidetrack. Quakenbush now realized that he had his man. To his surprise, Silvera quickly confessed to two killings in Oregon, said he was a prominent member of the FTRA Brotherhood, admitted to being a heroin user, and then gave the details of six more killings. He wanted to get it all off his chest. He was tired of the lifestyle. He said he was glad he got caught because he would have continued to kill. That's why I was wondering. I wonder if he had one of those like inner monologues where it's like he desperately wanted to stop, but he just couldn't. Yeah, I know that he felt shame, you know, almost uh, after almost every killing, he would cover their faces Uh or killed them 
while they were covered Mm -hmm. when he couldn't see them. You know, like there are those people that fly into a rage and really can't think clearly. Like, I wonder if that was part of the problem. I think he control himself. I think he did that. And I also think he allowed himself to transform into that. He wanted someone to piss him off. Like there was um, Agamon and yeah, he he was camping with someone and he burnt the food purposely to That's start a fight crazy. or he the, oh when they had the argument about splitting the last beer it was because he went to the store and only brought back one beer to be a dick so maybe he just had a need for it i think so well i and i think i kind of talk about it a little bit his youth but i in the first part i talked about the time when his abusive father tried to make him beat up some kids with a baseball bat oh, oh, right, right. which right. made me think that maybe the dad also used that baseball bat to hit silvera and i i think it just played out as an adult He's smashing his dad to pieces. Yeah, he's angry and he's got to go somewhere. In an interview soon after his arrest, Silvera told Detective Quakenbush he had killed 28 people. His first murder indictment came through on March 12th in Salem, Oregon, for the murder of William Pettit. In custody, Silvera also detailed numerous random murders across the country, which I could not confirm, and I'm only going to go into one of them, the first. Having spent some time in jail for auto theft and unable to hold a steady job, at 21, Robert Silvera hit the road, hitchhiking from California to Arizona. Walking along the highway one day with his pack on his back, a mid-40s man in a black car slowed beside him, asking if he needed a ride. Silvera said he was going to Tucson, and the man said hop in if you could pay for some gas, so Silvera paid him in food stamps. The man drove them a few miles down a dirt road off the highway, saying he wanted to stop and drink a beer. Their empty cans became targets after the man produced a 9mm German Luger pistol. The man went first. Silvera threw the can in the air, and the man shot several holes in it. When he handed the gun to Silvera and stood behind him, Silvera whirled around and shot him in the face. He hoisted the body and flopped it into the trunk, then drove the car into a ravine, stuffed twigs and bits of wood into the tank spout, and lit it with a road flare. Silvera scrambled a short distance away, up and out of the ravine, and watched the car burn into a smoking heap. Silvera gathered his gear, stored the gun in his pack, and walked back to the highway, where he soon caught a ride to Tucson. It was an event from which Silvera learned and made adjustments. He now knew that he needed a faster escape after a killing, that he shouldn't kill those who could be noticed as missing, and that he needed to have the upper hand at all times. Silvera later said, quote, He went back later to the same spot in Arizona where he had set the black sedan on fire. He was surprised to see there was no evidence of any incident there. It was like it never happened. There was only sand. In research for these episodes, I could find no record of this missing, murdered man or his burnt out car. Are you telling me I cannot trust a train hopping sociopath murderer? It's true. Hmm. Well, that takes out a few of the guys I'm seeing. (laughs) Unmatch, unmatch. That was another one of the cases where Silvera said that the guy made a move on him. When he first Mm. picked him up, was like, hey, do you like to party? And then when they were shooting the gun, the man stood behind him to be like, here's how you shoot. And Silvera said that the guy like kind of squeezed him and that's when he did it. But I don't believe any of that is true. Lieutenant William G. Palmini heard many of Silvera's confessions. He'd been the lead on the July 1995 murder of James J.C. McLean in Albany, California who'd been bludgeoned to death after inviting Silvera into his hut to drink a beer. Detective Palmini was more than your everyday murder police. He was also Elvis. Along with his band and the lawmen, he sang his king of rock and roll style tunes dressed like the man himself in a white jumpsuit, gold medallions, and a black pompadour wig. Since at least the late 70s, he'd been teaching kids about traffic safety with songs like Designated Driver Blues, Chief Operator, One Way Ride, and the heartfelt classic Daddy Please, (laughs) some of which were hits on local radio. Kids went bonkers for them, and the band's album Traffic Safety Gold received an honorary gold record from the Recording Industry of America in 1996. A handful of Elvis and the Lawmen songs are available on YouTube, and a link to those clips is in my sources. Please enjoy. Aww. 
Robert Silvera told Palmini that he had killed at least one person in each state he visited in his rail travels. Silvera had been through 38 states, 10 more murders than he'd admitted to Salem detectives. Palmini found it relatively easy to get Silvera to talk, as he recognized Palmini as the Elvis cop, which endeared him to Silvera, forming between them something nearing friendship. When Silvera was finally in prison, there was a photo of the two of them shaking hands after their interview, and Silvera had that up in his cell. Maybe he just really liked Elvis. I think so. Well, yeah, I think he respected a cop that was actually helpful in that way, at least, yeah. On March 9th, 1996, just a week after his initial arrest, the Sacramento Bee reported a claim from Silvera's uncle Lloyd Chapin of Stockton that Silvera admitted to him the number of his victims was 47. In part one, I mentioned an incident in which Silvera's father tried to make him beat up some kids with a baseball bat. Well, Uncle Lloyd had been present that day, goading the boy on, a bully just like the boy's father. In Oregon at the end of January 1998, Silvera took a guilty plea as part of a deal. In mid-February, he did the same in his Kansas case, and on May 20th, 1998, he pleaded guilty as a part of a bargain in Florida. Those were for the, the murders of William Pettit in Oregon, Charles Boyd in Kansas, and Willie Clark in Florida. After sentencing in the Oregon court, Silvera thanked Marion County District Attorney Diana Moffitt on his way out of the courtroom. He avoided the death penalty and, according to Wikipedia, is currently serving two life sentences in Wyoming Medium Correctional Institution in Torrington, Wyoming, where he serves as the head cook. The Freight Train Riders of America did away with their color-coded bandanas and conchos after Silvera's arrest. Three years after that, a writer from the Guardian newspaper at the train yard in Spokane spotted, quote, under a nearby concrete bridge, the signature graffiti for sidetrack, a white daubing of two tracks, a spider's web, and a crushed skull. Elvis cop detective Bill Palmini retired in 2003. His book on Silvera, co-written by Tanya Chalupa and titled Murder on the Rails, was released the next year. Publishers Weekly deemed it long on splatter and short on insight. That's pretty accurate. The book was extremely helpful in its investigative detail, but the descriptions of the crimes and Silvera's motivations seem skewed by Silvera's version of events. So I left out anything that reads like fabrication or justification of his actions. Salem, Oregon detective Mike Quakenbush, a hero to hobos who made him a knight of the hobo order of merit in honor of his brave and relentless pursuit of Robert Silvera, said, regarding these and many other killings of transient and houseless people, quote, Quakenbush could barely hide his anger about the fate of the dispossessed and the double standards throughout America. There's a great system of justice for the rich, but forget it if you're a nobody. In July of 1996, the Associated Press reported, California and Oregon police say a search of two locations in Roseville, California this month turned up letters and notes purportedly written by Silvera and discussing killings. The letters were to a former Placer County, California jailmate who once occupied a cell next to Silvera. In one of these letters, Silvera pronounced himself the leader of his nation, that of the houseless, the drifters, and the forgotten. He declared, I could have tortured others of your world, but I chose to torture my world because I preyed on the weak. Wow. So in the end, he's serving life. I believe a double life sentence. Okay. Yes, he'll be in prison forever. And they were only able to confirm how many killings? I believe four. I believe it was the two Oregon ones, Michael Kleitz, William Pettit, the Willie Clark in Tallahassee, Florida, and Charles Boyd in Kansas, Okay, who was the one that he killed in the state park. But outside of that, it's like, we don't really have the evidence, so it's really more of his tall tales, they yeah. presume. I mean, I think he did a lot of them, but I also, yeah, I think maybe the random ones, there's some confabulation there, but the ones that I've covered were the ones that, that they were like certain that he did. And I think there's there are many others across the country that just couldn't be definitively tied. But oh, it's okay, like, so they do think it. they do think he killed many people. Yes. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Just so violent, and just that constant moving. Yeah, is what's really it's amazing they were unsettling. able to get him. Mm-hmm. I would think that uncertainty of being on the rails all the time would lead to that anger. Mm -hmm. It would it would increase your rage, I think. Yeah. Seeing people, you know, as you're you're rolling by in the train, seeing people live more of a regular life 
right. probably probably developed a lot of hate that way too. Well, another one, and maybe what inspired you going down this track? Hey. Uh, <laughs> the book that you and I have read, The Man on the Train or Man from the Train. Yeah, that was definitely part of the reason I wanted to do this one. Yeah, The Man on the Train is one of the best. So that's a good one for yeah. people, since you're saying the one you did for the story isn't great. <laughs> it's kind of the same idea of this serial killer who had a very specific pattern and ended up across the country, I think even in the Northwest. Yeah, yeah. I think one. Check that out by Bill James. It's awesome. Go watch Emperor of the North. You could have been a meat eater. Sidetrack. You got no class. Splash. <laughs> Movie ends. <laughs> bye bye. I had friends that had them in baggies. They're like, oh, those are my star wrappers. <laughs> Like they're going to get like they were going to send them in. They still have them. These are only appreciating. You have to go to that Corvallis Dairy Mart. (laughs) (laughs) Look who's calling me. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, right, boy. Boy. Boing. 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 He dressed in a sweatshirt. 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 I got to wear my sweatshirt. Sweatshirt. Where's my favorite sweatshirt? I got to wear it today. Ew, that went in my mouth. Oh, ew. The wet hanky when I breathed in. Ew, 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 ew. Now I gotta use this crack hanky. Interesting. Cut that. I didn't say interesting. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Fascinating. Intriguing. That's gripping. Oh, I like that. I'm gonna use that. Gripping. <laughs> I was gonna bring the, the syllabus, thesaurus in here oh, so- and just leave it open when anyone says that. I'll be like, don't you mean? Interesting. Oh. oh. Don't you mean compelling? Uh, <laughs> thrilling. <laughs> Fascinating. We just need to sit and make a bunch of synonyms to record for him to pop in now. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> like edit. So that way, whenever we say interesting, you just copy over it with one Instead of our Instead of a ones. sensor, it's... Yeah. Wow, that is so... Fascinating. But, we will, but we'll do it in all sorts of inflections. <laughs> Detective Quakenbush sent a tail... Telegram, oh, telegram. I'm gonna, I'm gonna not do the beginning of that sentence I'm again. I'm gonna send a telegram. <laughs> Yoshikawa was the lead. Yoshikawa was the lead. I love it when you can beat me to it. It's the only way I can survive. Of what? Of wild pack. Sorry, Tim. Tim. No, Tim. Tim. No, Not this morning. Not this time. <laughs> the trains have stopped. Oh no! Oh. You're living. Well, there was one. The I had actually um, a derailment early this morning, <laughs> <laughs> and now nothing. Very early derailment. Oh. And you don't expect it. Well, that's the worst. It's like I... the sun's not even up yet. I gotta take care of this business. <sighs> I am in no state. I was just dreaming about. Walking around on the floor, leaving blood everywhere. And now we know, for future reference. Wear a diaper on your foot? I meant how easily blood cleaned up, but yeah, that too. (laughs) You should see how often I almost fall over. I really like that one. So often. (laughs) Metcalf said he believed there was a warrant out in that name. In that name. In that name. Your name. I don't worry about your name. Sorry, guy. We've been looking for you. You're going to come with me. Going to the slammer. Long arm with the laws. Finally catch him. Get into the clink. He was a bad, bad we boy. We got another one. <laughs> I'm so close to retirement. <laughs> I'm going on glory. <laughs> he got a call. She's crazy about that little guy. <laughs> we got to get to this Elvis cop. Ooh, oh, yeah. a new season he... of Circle is coming. Oh, oh fuck. Oh, That's there's sweet. a new season of Is It Cake? <laughs> that happened to me once when I was a child. I got locked out of the house with my sister after school, and I had to pee, and then she convinced me to pee my pants. Have I told that story before? Boy, it worked. She was very convincing. I was like, you know what? I will do that. That's a great idea. Why take it out and pee? In our own backyard. God. Oh, it was like the story Mac told about you. Pretending that you had died from being, oh, uh-huh. from tripping over a thing that he'd put up, <laughs> yeah, for like twenty minutes, you like la- you lay dead on the floor <laughs> while he panicked. 
<laughs> oh my god. He shouldn't have tripped me. Yeah, that he like... is too funny. Yeah. <laughs> How old is he? He's like eight. Probably. Oh yeah. my god. <laughs> nice. So funny. <laughs> Dead <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> Yeah, I think he was like, it was when I pushed 9 oh. 1 on the phone. You're oh like, my God. just kidding. <laughs> Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production, written, hosted, and edited by Josh McCullough, Emily Rowney, and Alicia Holland. Feel free to email us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. For as little as a dollar a month, you can subscribe on Patreon to get exclusive access to ad free and older episodes. For only $5, you can access Patreon-exclusive episodes and content. For more of us, be sure to follow on all the socials, listen to Josh and Alicia on their other show, Always Be My Sisters, and follow Emily on TikTok at M underscore Murder in the Rain. And suck my balls. <laughs> <laughs>